We're not crazy, the system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Pacifica Affiliate WXOJLP FM 103.3 Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we have um, environmental and philosophical writer um, Derek Jensen, and he um, has been working very hard to alert people to the, the depth and the enormity of our environmental catastrophe that we're moving into. He's a, he's a brilliant um, writer. If you have not read his books, I really um, urge you to check them out. He has a real conversational style, very talented, lyrical writer. And at the same time, he's he's grappling with some very, very powerful truths that society is um, very reluctant to take a look at. And so we're going to be speaking with him about um, environmentalism, but also just the way in which the whole society is in a lot of ways um, itself um, in a grip of madness and um, the difficulty of trying to break to break out of that. So uh, welcome to Madness Radio, Derek Jensen. Well, thank you for having me. And I should say that you're the author of a number of books, um, Endgame, which is two volumes, The Culture of Make-Believe, a language older than words, uh, Listening to Land. You have a book, um, an anti-zoo book. Tell us from, from your perspective, really, what's the scope of this problem and what are some, kind of, some of the kind of things that you're getting trying to get people to look at? Um, well, the scope is that this culture is killing the planet. Um, 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone um, there is 10 times as much plastic as phytoplankton in the ocean. And if you did the equivalent in a deciduous, uh, temperate deciduous forest, that would be the equivalent of having uh, styrofoam 90 feet deep over all the forest. Um, there's, car- there's carcinogens in every stream in the country, in the world. There's docks in every mother's breast milk on the planet. Um, smelt populations are collapsing. Salmon populations are collapsing. It's and people go through their days as though, as though nothing is wrong. And even the solutions, the so-called solutions presented to, for example, global warming, are fundamentally insane in that they take industrial capitalism as a given and they take the natural world as secondary, as the, the real physical world as secondary. And that is literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality. And this is, this is just insane everywhere. I, I was doing a terrible, terrible radio interview in Santa Barbara maybe a year ago where the radio interviewer, um, I kept saying, you know, some of the things I just said about 90% of large fish in the oceans are gone, all the plastic in the docks and all that stuff. And the guy kept saying, that's all nice, Derek, but let's get back in the real world. And what he means by that is let's get back to industrial capitalism. Industrial capitalism is the real world for him. And that's how a lot of people, like in college, a lot of kids will say, oh, what are you going to do when you get in the real world? And, you know, what they mean is what are you going to do when you have to get a job that you hate. You know, what, what am I going to do when I get in the real world? I'm going to roll around in the dirt. You know, that's the real world. Of course, this is not news. I mean, the indigenous people have been saying this forever, but this is, this culture is insane. And the scope of the problem, and it runs from the most global sense in terms of all the things we're talking about to um, the most intimate sense in the rates of child abuse, rape. I mean, the gold standard studies on the rate of sexual assault of women is about 25% of the women in this culture have, have been sexually assaulted, and another 19% have end off rape attempts. And all the women I know say that those figures are actually quite low, and that the real figures are much, much higher. And well, there's a great line by Robin Morgan. She says that anywhere in the world, any woman can be walking alone late at night, and if she hears footsteps behind her, she has reason to be afraid. So systematic violence by men against women has fundamentally altered the behavior of half of the human population right there. I mean, this whole this whole system is insane, you know, micro to macro and top to bottom, inside and out. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have you on, on Madness Radio, because that's a lot of the message that we're trying to um, present, is that instead of identifying, you know, people who don't do normal so-called behaviors or aren't adjusted or aren't functioning or aren't participating or aren't working or aren't going to school as being the ones who are sick and they're crazy, well, actually, maybe we ought to look at craziness and insanity as being kind of the way of life that we're living in. And Derek, one of the things that's disturbing about, um, you know, the looking at the environmental crisis and the writing that you're doing is that you're, one of the things that you're doing is, is alerting us to the fact that many 
scientists are joining this perspective. I, I was reading something uh, just recently that you had written reporting about how there is now a, a movement among environmentalists and climatologists that's saying that actually ec ecological systems like the world climate system or different habitats, different ecosystems, um, don't necessarily adapt slowly and gradually. A lot of times they reach a breaking point and then there's like a sudden collapse. And I know that's been one of the, the messages that you've been trying to get across is that part of the insanity of our industrial civilization is that we're reaching this point of sudden, rapid, catastrophic collapse. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty interesting thing, that um, these natural communities will struggle and struggle and struggle to maintain stability until they reach a collapsing point, and then everything falls apart. You know, you can take out, you know, a certain amount of fish in a lake and a certain amount more fish and a certain amount of more fish and the lake can recover but if you take out then if you reach some certain critical mass some critical point suddenly the uh the whole thing collapses and that's what we're seeing everywhere we're seeing cascading system failure if you want to use mechanical language and we're seeing a a, a mass species extinction worldwide that's pr unprecedented since the uh, the dinosaurs right um yeah and in fact in some ways it's it's worse than the dinosaurs because um, this is uh, getting to the very... And there, there are also phytoplankton collapse, population collapses, and when, when you mess with the very base of what everyone eats in the ocean, I mean, it's all over. Also, I mean, there's all this plastic. Like I said, 10 times as much plastic as phytoplankton. Plastic is not edible by anyone. And that's actually... We don't have to get into this right this second, but that's that's... A book that I'm working on right now with Eric McVeigh, we're almost done with, has to do with, it started off being about decay. And um, if you, you know, it used to be that if you poop, then that's just food for someone else. But now the waste products of this culture, everybody's waste products were always, always, always somebody else's food. That, you know, my body will become someone else's food. But now this culture has created all sorts of waste products like plastic that nobody knows how to eat. Um, I've been talking to mycologists and to people who work with plastics, people who work with, uh, work with decay, and they say it will be at least um, a half a million years for uh, someone, you know, some bacteria or someone. It will take a long, long, long time, maybe never, for anyone to learn, to evolve, how to eat plastic, because plastic was made to be permanent. It was made to not decay, and what decay means is somebody else is eating it. And it was made for that, and that's... So this plastic is going to be hanging around the oceans, I mean, for all practical purposes, forever. What happens is that um, various fish, birds, everybody eats them. And there was a sperm whale washed up on shore near where I live, here in Crescent City, and... Um, it was a juvenile sperm whale, and its belly was full, and it died of starvation. Its belly was full of plastic, and that happens all the time. I mean, this 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 culture is undergo is is undercutting the very basis for life on this planet. What are some of, What are some of the other ecological I examples that that illustrate this this collapse? Um, well, the the big news the last couple of days is that smelt populations are collapsing. They're they're small fish, and they used to be so common. I mean, when my mom was a little girl. They used to go out and used to catch smelt by, um, by just uh, when the wave would come in, you would just take a bucket, you would take a net, and you'd, you'd fill it up, and then you go home and you you eat smelt. And smelt um, were one of the fundamental foods for uh, indigenous peoples all along. Um, I don't know how far. Yeah, I guess that, that was in South So so all along the all along the, the west coast, and I don't know about the east, but but I mean that's an, that's another one. And uh, river systems are. I mean, the Colorado River doesn't even reach the ocean. The Rio Grande River doesn't reach the ocean. I mean, it doesn't matter which migratory songbird populations are collapsing. Um, Bob Whites have gone down by 80% in the last 40 years. And the head of Audubon, her response to that was um, that she doesn't think it's an emergency. I can guarantee that if the United States' gross domestic product went down by 80% in 40 years, the whole capitalist press would scream at it's an emergency. It doesn't really matter. I mean, okay, uh, great eight populations are uh, going are going. Um, polar bears obviously are going. Great cats are going. And there's, there's also something called an extinction debt, which means that sometimes if you destroy habitat, there are those who can still survive for a while, but they need the habitat to survive. So even if the habitat destruction were to stop now, 
there, there will be this dwindling that continues because it takes a long time for a forest, for example, to reach a climax state. The redwood trees here grow, um, I mean, they can live for a couple thousand years. And if you say a thousand years, or we, so we hope that a forest will be recovered in a thousand years. In a thousand years, you haven't even, you haven't even gone through one quarter of the uh, sort of or a half of, the, of one lifestyle, of one, one lifetime. It takes a long time for a tree to grow and then get to maturity and then die and decay and the whole process to start over. So it's only one generation if, if you have a tree that lives a thousand years, and a thousand years will only be one generation. Or also, the average age, I read this not a while ago, that the, the average age of Doug firs in this country I think is now down to like 75 years or something. They don't even reach sexual maturity until they're much older than that. So basically there's nothing but juveniles. And it's the same with the fish in the ocean. There's nothing but juveniles and, and tiny ones. Once again, this is, this is true at, at, every, at every level. And I love the stuff about Artie Lang. Artie, Artie Lang talks about how in order to rationalize the military-industrial complex, we've had to destroy our capacity to see beyond the end of our noses, to imagine anything, to be able to see, to perceive. And he said that um, without the most thorough brainwashing in the history, in, in any history, that you know, children, that, you know, children with their dirty minds would see through, their, through our dirty tricks, so we have to brainwash them. And as he says, I love this line, we have to turn them into imbeciles like ourselves, with, preferably with high IQs. Yeah, I love that. I, I love that line too, and I think it's um, it's really often uh, young people who are really more connected to seeing visionary implications and the the reality of the situation that we're in because they haven't quite been as adapted and enculturated and and, and socialized. And one of the things that I I think your work is really helping me to wake up to and helped a lot of people to wake up to is that when we talk about the environment, we talk about polar bears, we talk about um, uh, plastic in the ocean, we're really not talking about something that's outside of us. We're ultimately talking about our way of civilization based on oil, based on complex agriculture, based on cities is really caught up in this ecological collapse that's happening. So can you tell us about that relationship and what you see happening in terms of the direction that our technological civilization is itself going as being something that's part of this ecological destruction? Well, it's inevitable. I mean, you can't have a system that lasts forever that's based on the use of non-renewable resources. Any reasonably intelligent child can tell you that if you have a finite amount of something and you're using it, you're going to use it up. And it's the same with the hyper-exploitation of so-called renewable resources, where, you know, if every year there are fewer salmon than the, than the year before, eventually they're going to disappear. Anybody who's not head of the National Marine Fisheries Service can understand that. I was thinking about this in terms of global warming. If you ask any reasonably intelligent child, how do you stop global warming that's based on the burning of oil and gas? I think any reasonably intelligent kid can answer that question. And then if you ask some 35-year-old um, consultant for a high-tech firm, they're going to give you some answer that actually protects high-tech firms and doesn't protect the real world. And once again, I also need to be really clear that where I live is on Talawa Indian land, and the Talawa lived here for 12,500 years, um, if you believe the myths of science. And if you believe the myths of the Talawa, they lived here since the beginning of time. And when the Europeans first arrived here, the place was a, was a, a paradise. I mean, they, they lived here for a long time. That's not any sort of noble, savage nonsense. That's that's simply true. They lived here for at least 12,500 years, and this culture has been here for about 180, and the place is trashed. So my point is that what is happening is not inevitable, is not, uh, is not natural. This is the result of a really, really, really sick and messed up system. So you don't have any faith or you don't have any, any sense that there's any real scientific validity to the idea that, well you know, technology is just going to step in and innovative business people are just going to step in and they're going to start coming up with new, sustainable, green technologies and we're just going to kind of shift gradually into something that's more um, benevolent and, and supportive and in, harmonious with the earth. Well, first, there isn't time. I mean, the salmon are dying right now. Um, the, there was a, the, yet another salmon collapse this year and the reason they're saying is because they were starving to death because there's not enough food for them. And second, I mean, I'm all for, I wish that we weren't, that this culture weren't insane. I mean, one of the things that that presumes is this destruction is rational in the first place, but it's not rational, and so it's not amenable to rational solution. That's another problem. Another problem is, I mean, I wish we were having this, this, this wonderful, great transition where we were slowly 
making all the right decisions just step by step by step and throttling down. But once again, that would only be true if, if the people doing it were trying to protect the real world as opposed to trying to maintain capitalism. And the next problem is that, I mean, shoot, you know, if I suddenly had a spare $15,000, of course I would get solar photo- photovoltaics. I mean, of course, it's a move in the right direction. But I don't pretend that that's actually sustainable because you have, if I'm going to have solar photovoltaics, that means I still have to have wiring, which means I still have to have um, copper, which means I still have to have mining, which means you have to have the infrastructure to bring it to me. And what am I going to power with this? I'm going to power a refrigerator, which is made of all sorts of metals, which have to be mined, which have to be brought in from all these other countries. They have to be smelted. They have to be um, manufactured. Um, technology doesn't exist. You can't just have solar photovoltaics and hot showers without the whole other mess and without um, this whole system where the rich get richer, the poor get poor. You have to have cops to, in, to, uh, to enforce the property rights of the rich and so on. The indigenous people with whom I've spoken have always said that the fundamental difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is that even the most open mind, open-minded of the Westerners perceive listening to the natural world as a metaphor as opposed to the way the world really works. And there's a great line about this by a Canadian lumberman. When I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And if when you look at trees, you see dollar bills, you're going to treat them one way. And if when you look at trees, you see trees, you'll treat them another way. If when I look at this particular tree, I see this particular tree, I'll treat it differently still. And so, so if... I mean, the, with, 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 with indigenous peoples, I mean, the tree here, right here, the one I'm looking at right now, would, um, would speak with me. And, or it might not speak with me, who knows? But some trees will speak. or They're all speaking, and I might be able to listen. But before you can exploit somebody, the first thing you have to do is silence them. And this culture is so alienated and perceives itself as so special that... Um, that it can't even perceive that these non-humans can speak. You know, the whole thing of interspecies communication and, and your, your recommendation that people go and listen to the river or listen to the, um, to the hummingbird or, or try and communicate as indigenous people do. And I'm wondering, what do you think of the idea that we can, that, that the real way that we can bring wisdom and strategy and effectiveness is by, in some ways, becoming indigenous ourselves and, and starting to, to learn to communicate with and commune with and have a spiritual um, relationship with the, the wild around us in a, in a literal way, not just as a, as a wouldn't it be nice to have this or let's do it sort of romantically or metaphorically, but actually cultivating those kind of, you could call them psychic abilities or sensitivities or whatever. That's, that's, that's a part of it, but remember that there have been millions upon millions of indigenous people who have fought and died to defend the land where they live, going back to those who fought against, uh, who eventually in mythology became Gilgamesh, to the people of the Near East, who, to, the, to the barbarians of Rome, to the Sabines, to the Goths, Visigoths, Celts, Picts, Gauls, um, to Tecumseh. So when people talk about, there's never, I've never encountered a single example of a traditional indigenous person prior to contact who was a pacifist, a dogmatic pacifist, who was a spiritual pacifist. And... Um, and so people say, people think that, 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 you know, it's just sort of communing with the natural world. Sorry. Tecumseh, Tecumseh said, um, war upon the living, war upon the dead. We need to dig up their bones and throw them into the ocean. He wanted, he, he wanted to kill every single white person and I can't blame him. Well, I I guess I, I guess I, I didn't mean, um, commune with the natural world instead of resisting, but I'm saying like, instead of just reading history books about different movements and but using using that as an actual as part of the mix of how do we make decisions as activists and how do we develop strategies absolutely and, sorry i misunderstood do you think it's actually possible for for white people to do that and people who've been industrially indoctrinated i think we can have our own experience we can't become indigenous i will never be indigenous because that that involves being a place long enough to see the patterns that happen over many 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 generations and the figure that I generally use is there's a study by Peggy Reeve Sanday about high and low rate cultures, and um, one of the you know all of the sort of markers of high rate cultures we you know we can see a lot of them are pretty obvious you know militarism, valorizing, disliking women, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of them is a, a history of ecological dislocation within the last four or five hundred years. Um, but that that stresses the culture and causes um, 
the men to take that on the women. And so that's sort of the that's sort of the if I wanted to say, you know, if I was just going to make up how long it would take to become indigenous. I would say 500 years. But you do think that we can maybe learn some things and try and um, incorporate that knowledge and incorporate some kind of relationship of listening and communication with the natural world into... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that doesn't... I want to be really, really specific about this. That doesn't mean I'm indigenous. The, that, that would discount the magnitude of what it is to be indigenous and the incredible wisdom that's there and that we're losing and that we can't just, we can't just get it back by um, studying herbalism or going on wilderness trips. I mean, that might help, but that's not going to solve the, uh, the problem there. So, Yeah, it's like I talked to, and then I really should go, but I talked to uh, Ashton Armstrong about this. You know, how does somebody become indigenous? She said, and she said, you know, the people of the, like the hill people in, in Appalachians, they're probably halfway there because, and I've known some people who went hunting with some of the people from the Appalachians, I mean, some real honest-to-goodness hill people, and they, you know, they can tell where the deer are, they can see stuff that you never see, and they have generations of that. And by the same token, you have somebody who's got indigenous blood, but they live in L.A., they're like halfway not. You know, they're, they're moving the other direction. People think that, that, oh, you know, the Indians would pray and that would make a difference. And yeah, sure, they have all this cosmic spiritual stuff, I've ridden in cars, but I can't build a car by myself. And so we all understand that that technology requires this whole communal infrastructure. But we don't respect their technologies of songs, dances, dreams, listening. We, in general, don't, don't respect the fact that those are entire technologies that are based upon traditions that are thousands of years in the making. And you just can't recreate them with a workshop or... Um... No, any more than I could create a car you know, all by myself. When I say that I want to bring down civilization, people have identified so strongly with civilization. I've identified more strongly with civilization than they have with being human animals who need habitat. And so a lot of times when I say I want to bring down civilization, people will say, oh my gosh, do you want all life to end? Because they, when I say civilization, they hear life. And that's a huge bit of insanity. John A. Livingston wrote this great book called The Fallacy of Wildlife Conservation. And in there, one of the things he talks about is how normally, how we evolved in intimate connection with the natural world and hearing all these different voices, hearing, um, I was just talking to somebody not very long ago who, who was talking to an old, old person in southern Canada who um, used to go out birding. And on a normal day, they might see 100, 150 species. And i got to tell you, I heard early, like five minutes ago, I heard one bird singing. And even in the past 10 years since I've lived where I live now, or nine years, I have seen a collapse of migratory songbird populations. There used to be a Phoebe every year. There would be one Phoebe that I'd have this relationship with. This year the Phoebe's not here. And, um, okay, so his point is that when people talk about being in cities, sometimes they talk about a sensory overload, that uh, it's, you know, there's this, like, this, this assault of sounds. But what he says is actually sensory deprivation, because all those sounds come from one origin. Every sound that they hear is the people here in the city. Everything they perceive is either human-originated or human-mediated. And so um, you, you, you start to hallucinate. He says that all of our ideologies are hallucinations, and I agree with that, that they're hallucinations because they're, they're, they're the delusions that you have when you, when you enter an echo chamber where the only voice you hear is yours. And so people can start to believe that the stock market makes sense, that, it, that it's important, that, um, that that's more important than the real world. Well, of course they do, because they have no connection with the real world. I mean, look around right now. And I was, I'm saying this to you, and I'm saying this to the listeners. Look around. How many machines do you see? And then how many wild animals do you see? How many machines are within 10 feet of you, 15 feet of you? And how many wild animals are within 100 feet of you, and wild plants are within 100 feet of you. And how many, um, how many machines do you have a daily relationship? My car, my computer, um, my alarm clock, uh, my refrigerator, my stove. How many wild animals do you have a daily relationship with? It, it seems like the argument that we really need to just completely get away from civil, civilization itself, is that the point that you're making, that it just goes all the way down into technology itself and we need to return to a more unmediated, more hunter-gatherer, pre-agriculture relationship with the natural world? Is that, is that what you think is the only 
really rational, sane response to the industrial technological um, crisis that we've gotten into? The only way of living that's ever been sustainable is hunter-gatherer and small-scale horticulture. That's the only way that's ever been sustainable. The San of South Africa, the Bushmen, they lived in place for like 2 million years, if you include their evolutionary predecessors. They lived in place basically forever. And, of course, now they're, getting, they're, they're, they're being put into internment camps. And, um, and they didn't destroy the land base. And um, this, this way of living is destroying everything. And if you care about physical reality... You know, you can't get more physical than, than the ocean, than, than these trees that I'm looking at right here. Um, if you care about physical reality, it's pretty clear what we need to do. And the hesitation is that, once again, we identify more strongly with this way of life than we do with life itself. Oh, and I remember the other thing I was going to say, which is um, something I talk about in my talks is I suddenly, I'll just stop, and I'll start suddenly talking about Angelina and Brad and I'll talk about um, Nicole Kidman. I'll talk about Tom Cruise. And then I'll just stop. And I'll say, what's the indigenous name for this place? Whose land is this? And I'll talk about how insane it is that I know who Brad and Angelina are, and I know that the one, two uh, members of the rotation for the New York Mets are pretty good. I mean, it's Johan Santana and Pedro Martinez. And at the same time, I can't name 10 species of edible plants and fungi within 100 yards of my home. And in terms of being out of touch with physical reality, that is insane. And one of the reasons we don't defend the places we live is because we don't live there. You know, we're, we know, we live out with Brad and Angelina and with the, with the movies and with TV and, and with baseball. I love baseball. I'm not, I'm not knocking baseball. But, but the fact is we live out there. We don't live, um, we don't live where we live. You know, I, I know the mazes of Half-Life 2 and Doom 3 better than I know the game trails that are within 100 yards of my home. And that's crazy. And I'm not saying, by the way, that it's sufficient. Oh, what this means, we just have to go outside and that'll be sufficient. That's one thing we have to do. But another thing we have to do is stop those who are killing the planet. We, just, we, got, we have to stop them. Because it's, it's not... I just got a big argument with this, this, this guy who thinks that it's enough to do stupid dances with scarves that, that make you feel like a butterfly, and he thinks that's what will really save the planet. And, so, and, and he was getting very, very upset because, um, because I don't actually want to stop those who are killing. And he, he said that, that me wanting to stop those means that, um, that I don't love. And... Um, <laughs> Because if you love, of course, then you can't fight back. And I think Mother Grizzly Bears will disagree with him. Um, you know, they'll really back me up on this one. And the truth is that not fighting back reveals an incapacity to love or a failure to love. Because if you love, you defend your beloved. I understand. I mean, the, the pacifism can become a very dogmatic uh, point of view. And I remember a quote, I don't have it, from Gandhi, often held up as you have to be nonviolent, you have to be pacifist. He actually argued that it was better to fight back violently than to not fight back at all. And he preferred and, and saw the superiority of nonviolence means, but he also recognized and validated the use of violence in certain kinds of, of contexts. And I, I definitely, you know, just talking with you and listening to you, there is this just sense of just overwhelming um, rationality. I mean, you're really coming from a very clearly rational point of view in terms of what we're actually getting into. And I think that um, that's not the place maybe that people are going to, disconnect that maybe the place that people are disconnecting is just this sense of, of just complete overwhelm and what do I do and I just want to explode and what can people do who are really trying to grapple with this reality and, and shake themselves out of this hallucination that we're in and take a look at and respond reasonably and rationally and authentically to what's happening to our natural world right now. And I ask people at my talks, I say, how many of you have had someone you love die of cancer? And usually about um, 80% will say, will raise their hands. And cancer is, of course, a disease of civilization caused in great measure by the toxification of the total environment. I mean, that's why they're called carcinogens. And um, so how intimate does it have to get before you start to resist? I mean, and I have Crohn's disease, which is a disease of civilization. Civilization is literally eating away at my gut. You know, how close does it have to get? And, and part of the problem 
is that once again we identify with this and we and we don't see it. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things is that within an abusive dynamic, within an abusive abusive system, whether it's a family system or a whole culture, everything everything is set up to protect the abuser. That's how it has to be. And so that's one of the reasons why our resistance is so ineffective is that even when we resist, it's it's still set up to, to, to do essentially nothing for the most part. And it's also really infantile, our resistance is, that I've been thinking about this, that pretty much our resistance consists of begging those in power to do the right thing when, when we know they won't, as opposed to, A, demanding they do the right thing, or else what? We're going to do a little butterfly dance, or we're going to, we're going to, we're going to sign a petition, or we're going to hold a candle. I mean, that's not a demand. It's still begging. And, or what about just bypassing them altogether and doing the right thing? What about simply protecting the places we love? Two things about this. One of them is I was down in uh, New Mexico doing a talk, maybe, oh gosh, a year ago or something. And uh, the local people that were doing this amazing work to try to um, stop yet another toxic dump in a, uh, another poor neighborhood of people of color. And I was thinking, you know, cops, they talk about, you know, to protect and to serve. And the cops were, of course, protecting the dump, which is owned by people from far away. And I was thinking, what would happen if cops were set up to enforce cancer-free zones or Walmart-free zones or deforestation-free zones? But, of course, they won't because they're agents of the system. So what about if we in our communities decide this is going to be a cancer-free zone, this is going to be a deforestation-free zone, and we set about to enforce that? I mean, that would be real communal policing. Now back up a second. And what do people do? I can't actually say what individuals should do because I don't know people's gifts, and I don't know what, they're, what they love to do. It's like I was, I was um, hanging out with this guy who is a wetland specialist, and I said, uh, and he's you know, digging, digging up some soil, and he rubs it between his fingers and compares it to his chart, and that's how you can tell whether it's wetland. That's one of the ways. And I just looked at him and said, do you get off on this? And he started laughing and said, yeah, I love it. It's my second favorite thing to do after playing with my dogs. And I just started laughing, too, because I, didn't, I would hate to do what he does. And on the other hand, I, uh, I get off on trying to figure out the relationship between perceived entitlement, exploitation, and hatred. I, just, I, you know, I condemn myself to a life of homework. It's just I really love doing that. And I, mean, I know people who totally love to uh, play with explosives. That's not me. I don't, I don't like that at all. I mean, I don't, it's not that I'm afraid of it. It just doesn't do it for me. I don't care. And I never liked chemistry. My only D in college was organic, or not organic, but my only D in chemistry was quantitative analysis chemistry lab. Um, I'm really inept at it. And so people have to find, another way to say all this is my friend Carolyn Raffensperger says the question all the time, one of the questions she loves is, what are the largest, most pressing problems that you can help to solve using the gifts that are unique to you and all the universe? What are your gifts, and how can you use them in the service of your land base? But there's something that has to happen before that, which is that... Well, it seems like you have to wake up to the, the reality that you're looking at, because the, a lot of the message that we get from capitalist individualism is, oh, yeah, everybody has gifts, and pursue your talents, and get a college degree, and go have your career. But you're asking, actually, for people to look at their gifts and their passions and what they get off on in the context of facing this enormous reality that we're in, and Derek, this is one of the things I love about your your writing is that you're you know you're writing you're a writing teacher, and you've said just so many powerful things about um, schooling. And one of the things that we've been talking about is about how people kind of get indoctrinated um, into you know, a belief of a false reality that uh, the industrial civilization horizon is a limitless horizon, and we just have to be inside of this technological machine, and that's all there is to it. And you just have to get along and. And adapt, and, and maybe you can say a little bit about you know how how you view schooling as being a big part of alienating people from nature and getting them to believe this collective hallucination that we're in about our technological uh, civilization. Oh, sure, that's a great question. And a couple of things. First thing I want to say is that um, you know so many indigenous people have said to me that the first thing that we need to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds. That we need to to recognize. So this is what I'd, I'd really want people to do is. Um, is to recognize that this culture is not the the only way to be, and it's not. And technological progress isn't good for us. It's not good for the planet. And to recognize 
that this culture is killing the planet, and to, and to recognize you're going to do something about it. And then also to um, ask the rivers where you live what they need. Um, you know, you're in Portland. What's the, you know, go ask the Columbia. What do you need? How can I help you? Who are you? How are you doing? What do you need? How can I help you? I mean, I don't know how to live sustainably. I don't believe you know how to live sustainably. The river knows how to live sustainably because it's been there for a long, long time. And it'll teach you. It'll, it'll tell you. If you listen to it, it'll tell you what it needs. So that's one thing. And then now back to school. I, I, that, that book has probably my favorite first couple lines of any book I've written, which, which is, um, as is true for most people I know, I've always loved learning. As is also true for most people I know, I always hated school. Why is that? I mean, school accomplishes this extraordinary thing, which is to make... I'm sorry, I'm speaking more slowly, because a hummingbird just flew down and landed a couple feet from me, actually about 10 feet from me. Maybe the uh, hummingbird likes likes the message of listening to nature and listening to the rivers and learning learning directly from them, yeah. Yeah, or maybe it's saying, um, hello, you know, you've been talking about all these trees. Uh, I'm here too. You might mention me. <laughs> um, who knows? Anyway, um, the... Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, so school accomplishes an extraordinary thing by getting us to not like learning and to, to not appreciate that process. And, I, you know, I, I thought for the longest time when I was in high school and junior high or junior high and high school, I always wondered why school took so long because so much of the material could be really conveyed in just a few years. You know, once you learn addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, decimals, you don't really learn anything else in math until you get to algebra. And... Um, then I, when I was in high school, in junior, junior in high school, I always thought that, that the reason that school took so long is they were trying to break you of the habit of daydreaming because that's how I spent all my time. It just got really boring, you know, winning the World Series, you know, 15 times in an hour. And then I finally realized the reason that school takes so long is because it, children don't, don't give up their wills easily, and it takes that long to break their wills sufficiently for them to, you know, enter that life of painful employment. And, and what's the most important piece of technology in any classroom? It's the second hand on the clock because the purpose is to teach all the students the same prayer, which is, please, God, make this thing move faster. And that's an extraordinary thing that it, it teaches you. And w- one of my friends says that a lot of environmentalists begin by wanting to protect a specific piece of ground and to question the foundations of Western civilization. And that was a little bit of it for me. That was part of it. But another part was because I began by questioning the wage economy and questioning, um, you know, why, I mean, I used to have this habit of asking people to like their jobs, about 90% would say no. And what does that mean when the vast majority of people spend the vast majority of their waking hours doing things they don't want to do? What does that mean? And we just go on as if that's normal. I think that's part of the hallucination and the, uh, the being asleep that you're talking about. You, you, have a, um, a, you have a quote here from, you have a quote here from R.D. Lang that I, I just think is really Wonderful. So much of his writing is so powerful and so directly related to what we're talking about. It says, um, from the moment of birth, when the Stone Age baby confronts, confronts the 20th century mother, the baby is subject to these forces of violence as its mother and father, and their parents and their parents before them have been. These forces are mainly concerned with destroying most of its potentialities, and on the whole, this enterprise is successful. By the time this new human being is 15 or so, we are left with a being like ourselves, a half-crazed creature more or less adjusted to a mad world. This is normality in our present age. And Lang was, was not, he wasn't actually even addressing the environmental crisis so much as just the way that we treat each other and the way that families abuse each other and can't communicate and the way that we turn ourselves right. into machines. And, and that's something I think is really interesting about your work is that you, you talk, you have a very psychological perspective about the violence that we're doing interpersonally being connected with the environment, with the violence that we're doing to the environment. Can you talk about that a, a little bit? Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of the same, same perspectives. And I think that some of them at least arise from the sort of same condition that I was saying earlier. When I said, you know, there's that line by the Canadian lumber mill, I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And we can say the same thing about women. If when I look at women, I see orifices, I'm going to treat them one way. And, and so the, the point, and then also there's the, the thing from, from a language older than words. That book was originally supposed to be a, a sort of happy face book about interspecies communication. And then I realized that to write a book that's happy about interspecies communication would be fundamentally a lie because it's not a happy situation right now. And it would also be really demeaning. So I was going to write a book that purported to show that non humans can think. And that would be, it's so obvious. But 
it would be like trying to write a book that shows that that um, blondes can think or that Jews aren't really subhuman. It would still hold up humans as a standard by which everyone else is judged. And then the, the book was really able to open up for me, and I was able to write it as soon as I realized, like I said earlier, that before you can exploit somebody, you have to silence them. And so that's one of the dynamics that that pushes all of this is that um, is the silencing of these other perspectives and the silencing of women, children, other races, other species. There's a great line by one, some Portuguese explorer back in the, I don't know, 16th century or something, talking about Africa. And he said, when they speak, they fart with their tongues in their mouths. And what he meant by that is they didn't speak Portuguese, which means they don't speak at all, which means that um, it's okay to enslave them. That's been the fundamental arrogance of this culture from the beginning, and that everyone and everything is here for you to exploit. I mean, that's even what, um, I mean, that's how uh, Darwin is usually read, that, you know, the survival of the fittest and um, the meanest, the most able to exploit. Um, you know, to show how stupid our discourse is, I can disprove that in one sentence, by the way, if you give me some semicolons, which is those creatures who have survived in the long run have survived in the long run, semicolon. You don't survive in the long run by hyper-exploiting your surroundings, semicolon. You survive in the long run by actually making your habitat better on its own terms, by by improving the habitat, by, by making the land happy that you're there. And that's true for any relationship. I mean, if you're in a romantic relationship and you're systematically exploiting the other person, I mean, that's, that's not really a sustainable way to run a relationship. Uh, once again, I mean, they're all, they're all linked, I think, by perception and by also by an, an inability to respond and an inability to respond appropriately. I love another R.D. Lang line, um, which is uh, the three rules of a dysfunctional family which are also three rules of dysfunctional culture. And rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. Rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existence of rules A, A1, or A2. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what this means on a family level is that, you know, within an abusive family, you can talk about anything you want except for the violence that you have to pretend isn't happening. And on a larger social structure or larger social scale, you know, we can, once again, talk about anything we want except for the fact that the culture is killing the planet. So, um, you know, we can talk about green technology, we can talk about all this other stuff, except we can't talk about the real, real story. And one of the things that I think listeners should really consider is that so, for so many of us, when we, when we go and we visit our families or we visit our, our parents, and it's not to be anti-family or anti-parent, but just we sort of step into a trance. Have you ever been in that situation with your family? Oh, my you God, just, yeah. You can't say what you're really thinking. You kind of, I become like I'm 14 years old again, and I can't really express who I am or what I'm really thinking. I think the connection that you're making here is that the power of that kind of trance, when we're having a, such difficulty expressing what we really think and feel around our parents, around our family, that's exactly the same kind of trance that we're in around industrial civilization. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it, that it's, it's so easy to fall into those uh, enculturated patterns. And it's, it's, a, it's a terrible, terrible trap. Just tell us a little bit about how your work is being received in the world, because my perception is that you really, you're really in some ways a prophet of our age, and I know what you're saying is very provocative, and you're stirring a lot of debate, but you've really touched a nerve, and I can only see the popularity of your work and your perspective and the movement that you're, you're part of and that we're part of really getting much, much more visible and, and clear and respected and understood and, and related to in the coming years, because so so clearly we're headed into in the direction of greater crisis and and um, difficulty and, and, and collapse, as you're describing. So tell us about the work that you're doing now and also about how the, your work is being received in the world. Um, how it's being received is um, uh, huh, it's split. That um, I get essentially no mainstream reviews, and the mainstream reviews I get are, or corporate reviews, I should say, are, are for the most part negative. Um, and on the other hand, there is this incredible, um, a lot of times in the Northwest, um, I will have 200, 300, 400 people show up at talks easily. Uh, just did a talk two weeks ago in Colorado, 220. Um, some pl in the Midwest, there's usually a lot. Uh, I just did a, a tour of Southern Canada a while ago, probably averaged about two to 300 per place, about, probably about closer to 300 per place. 
And then I just did a talk a few days ago in New York in um, at Sarah Lawrence, probably about 80 people. New York's never been very uh, hot for me. But the point is that I think that's actually really good. And the point is not my talks, but the point is that there are um, hundreds of people who are coming to hear a talk about bringing down civilization. And I don't think, I mean, I'm really glad that the, uh, that, that awareness is getting out there. Um, so that's, that's more or less how it's being received. Um, I have another question, which is, what is the gives you hope these days in terms of what's going on in the world? Well, I don't actually believe in hope. I think hope's a very, 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 very bad thing because um, hope, what it really means or what it really is, is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. That's how we use it in day-to-day language. You know, I don't hope that I eat something later today. I'm just going to do it. On the other hand, whenever I get on a plane, I hope it doesn't crash because um, I don't have any agency once I'm in the air. And so that's... I mean, that's, that's once again how we use it in everyday language. If, if a, a parent says to a child, you know, will you please clean your room, and the kid says, I hope it, does, I hope it gets done, you know, I hope it gets clean, that's yeah, a total non-starter. And same, you know, say, say you're in a class, and the, the teacher says, okay, your homework's here for tomorrow, and you say, well, I hope it gets done. Everybody just looks at you. But we always say, oh, I hope the salmon survives. Well, what you're saying by that is that you're fundamentally meaningless, or that you're fundamentally um, without power. And I refuse. I mean, that's that's simply not. That's not that I refuse. Well, that's just not true. Mm. What about uh, in, what about inspiring you in terms of the things that you're seeing going on uh, around? I know you, you. It's very inspiring that people are, are interested in your in your talks and coming to hear you. But what kinds of initiatives and things are are inspiring to you in terms of what people are doing around the world? Honestly, um, for the most part, I don't see a lot that's all that great going on. I I, I think that our resistance is is extraordinarily ineffective. Um, I think there's a lot of people doing... Um, th- I mean, I, I, I am really happy with how uh, that a lot of people are doing a lot of really good work, but all the people who actually are doing the frontline work that I know of all are consistently just uh, terribly, terribly frustrated because um, because the game... It's not a game, the because the rules are rigged, you know, everybody knows. A great example is that there was this developer came in, developer, with see, there we go, even the language is really rigged. He's not a developer because a forest doesn't develop into a bunch of homes, you know, no, sorry, a bunch of houses, spec houses. That's not development. You know, a butterfly, I mean, a caterpillar develops into a butterfly, a child develops into an adult. A forest doesn't develop into a subdivision. So this subdivider, this killer, came into the neighborhood and was going to destroy this very small bit of patch of forest over here. And so we in the neighborhood opposed him. And we had everything on our side. First, the entire neighborhood is against him. And second, he was caught in a bunch of very obvious lies. He said there's no wetlands on the land. There's a stream that runs right through it that we got pictures of. We, we you know, at every level, he's lying about everything. Anything we can lie about, he's lying about. And um, we opposed him at every step of the way. And we ended up suing, and we had an attorney who literally wrote the book, literally wrote the book on um, fighting the California Department of Forestry. And we had, the law was on our side. We had, I mean, she's great. And the attorney for the other side um, was citing laws that don't exist, and then she would, you know, cite the exact case law to show how it didn't exist. Once again, we had every single thing on our side, which means we had to settle. You know, if they would have had one thing on their side, we would have lost. And this is what happens every time. I mean, the judge, the judge was so clearly going to decide against us. It's the system is rigged, 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 rigged. And everybody who works within this works works against the system knows it. And I think that that can be said about our political system as well. I mean, I'm 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 not as as my friends know, I'm not. In, interested at all in the Obama Hillary debates? I think it's it's really pretty. It's pretty. It's like a rigged game that I'm being invited to play. Totally to play. rigged game. And so we don't. We we're, we're we're about out of time with the interview, and I, there's so much that we could that we could talk about. But I wanted to make sure. I uh, thank you so much for for joining us. And I, and I just wanted to see if you had if you have any last minute um, last uh, last minute words that you want to leave our our listeners with because it's it is such a, it is such a pessimistic 
hard topic to try and to try and struggle with and what would maybe what would you like to leave with people to encourage them to sort of start waking up about this people a lot of people seem to think that if you really acknowledge how bad things are that you have to go around being miserable all the time but the truth is I'm really really happy and life is really really good and you can acknowledge how bad things are and that doesn't mean you have to be miserable all the time and you know I am full of people are so afraid of anger but I am full of anger and rage and hate and love and joy and satisfaction dissatisfaction we're allowed to feel more than one thing at the same time and just because you start a post, there's a great Irish proverb, is this a private fight or can anybody enter? You know, even though the game's rigged, it's still a tremendous amount of fun to fight. And here's another thing I can say, is that we're going to win. And the reason I know we're going to win is because you can't fight the natural world. And the natural world's going to win, and I want to be on the winning side. Derek, let us know um, about your website and um, your latest work and how people can get in, get in touch with you if they want to find out more information. Um, well, the latest work I have out is As the World Burns, 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Stay in Denial, which is a, uh, a graphic novel. It's really fun. And um, the, uh, uh, I have a website, which is www.derrick, D-E-R-R-I-C-K, J-E-N-S-E-N, dot O-R-G. Derek Jensen, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Oh, thank you. You've been listening to an interview with Derek Jensen. Derek is an environmental uh, writer, and he's written a number of books. You can find out more information on his website, DerekJensen.org. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is broadcast every Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio in Northampton, Massachusetts. For our live internet stream, podcasting, show archives, and more, visit madnessradio.net. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and The Icarus Project. For more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net. KWMD, Kasilov. 90.7, Anchorage 104.5.